Thank you very much, everyone, for joining this uh, first of a series of new uh, online webinars that the GFTU is going to run called The Bigger Picture, uh, hoping to give us an opportunity to discuss with some real experts in their fields the uh, question of China in the world, the next time round, uh, the nature of uh, US imperialism and the US economy, and uh, then finally, with Kate Hudson from CND, uh, is NATO a friend or a foe? Uh, we think that it's um, important that trade unionists and political activists always keep uh, an eye on what's happening in the world so that we're not suddenly caught short as we, as our predecessors were in the First World War and as our generation was in relation to the Falklands, Iraq and Serbia. Um, and uh, to see the hysteria that we're in the middle of at the moment and reflect how that can easily um, be translated into worse forms of hysteria as we saw in relation to Iraq and so on, can be quite worrying. So we need to keep our eyes on uh, what's happening in the world. Um, I don't think we've got quite enough time to introduce us, all of us, uh, at the start, Sasha, but we can do that as we go along with a relatively small group. We've got uh, two distinguished uh, speakers to set off the discussion, uh, and the discussion is held within the, the framework of our uh, education, education Trust. Trust. The Education Trust, which is a charity, runs lots of education through the GFTU in the best traditions of working class education. There's no such thing as a stupid question. We expect lots of questions and we expect to improve our knowledge. And we do that on the basis of facts rather than opinions. So it's an educational uh, uh, workshop that we've devised for this evening. And um, we simply asked um, our colleagues, Carlos and Keith, to uh, give us an introduction to a discussion which we can then uh, all join in with. Um, so first of all, uh, Carlos Martinez, who um, is uh, an author and political analyst of China uh, and a member of the Friends of uh, Socialist China uh, group, which is an international group, uh, is going to start the discussion with uh, some observations about uh, the domestic policies in China. Uh, if it's okay, the, the part the speakers are okay with it. Uh, if participants are okay with it, we'll record it because we know that other people want to listen in in the future. So, if anyone objects, say so now. Otherwise, we'll record it, and then please feel free to put questions and comments in the chat as we go through. If it doesn't distract too much from our speakers, so um, once again, many thanks for kicking off this series, and uh, thanks, Carlos. Over to you. Thank you very much, Doug, and good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, I'm going to try sharing some slides. Let's see how that goes. Uh, can you see some slides? Great. They're not terribly yep. exciting, but um, some slides is better than no slides is the motto I live by. Um, so uh, in these, I've just got about 10 minutes, and in these remarks, I just... I'm going to focus on two aspects of modern China that, and particularly its domestic policy that I think are particularly important and that I think are sort of representative of the way that things are going in China. Um, and those two key areas that I'm going to follow are the battle against poverty and the struggle against climate breakdown. So as you probably know, just under two years ago, China announced that it had successfully completed its goal of eliminating extreme the start of the targeted poverty alleviation program, which was 2014, just under 100 million people were identified as living below the poverty line. Um, you know, literally, they sent hundreds of thousands of people out into the villages, um, party workers, government workers, volunteers, to identify people who were who were living under what had been established as a poverty line. And, and they identified about 90, 90 million people. Seven years later, that number was zero. And UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is on record as describing this as the greatest anti-poverty achievement in history. Um, 
And, you know, this achievement wasn't really reported very much in the Western media. Um, certainly it didn't get anywhere like the coverage that certain other China related stories do, particularly those stories that paint China in a negative light. Where it was covered, journalists tended to sort of quibble over the definition of poverty, questioning if the Chinese claim to have eradicated extreme poverty was really legitimate. So let's just quickly clear up what the Chinese mean when they say that they've eliminated extreme poverty. What does it mean to not suffer extreme poverty in China? So the easiest bit to measure is the income threshold, which is kind of pretty, pretty standard figure. It's set at the World Bank defined international poverty line of $1.90 per day, which is of course not a huge amount of cash. But according to the Chinese definition, a person can only be considered to have left extreme poverty if the what they call the two assurances and three guarantees have been met. So the two assurances are for adequate food and clothing, and the three guarantees are for access to medical services, safe housing with drinking water and electricity, and at least nine years of free universal education. Um, and aside from that, you've also got uh, the factor of the land ownership system in China, which means that the rural poor, even if they're you know, extremely poor, they've got rent free access to land and to housing, which puts them in a very, very different category to the rural poor elsewhere in the world. Um, so therefore, ending extreme poverty means that literally everyone's basic needs are adequately met. They enjoy sufficient access to food, clothing, housing, clean water, modern energy, education and healthcare. Um, and to provide for everybody's basic needs like that in an enormous developing country is a pretty incredible achievement. For example, half of my family is Indian. I've been to India many times and the contrast with China is stark. You know, you, you really don't have to look very far at all in India to see intense poverty, both urban and rural. There are millions of children that still don't go to school there are hundreds of millions that don't have access to clean water, hundreds of millions that don't have access to modern energy, to electricity in their homes, tens of millions that live in debt bondage, tens of millions that live in peri-urban slums uh, around cities like Chennai, Mumbai, Delhi and whatnot. And, you know, I don't say any of that to sort of disparage India because um, in many ways it's made very impressive progress since it won its independence in 1947. And fixing these types of problems isn't easy. Um, but the whole class basis of Indian society is just so different to that of China. You know, not having had a revolution as China did, India still hasn't been able to really wipe out feudalism and political power is monopolized by landlords and by big capital. Um, so India, you know, those classes simply aren't going to channel those types of resources into meeting the needs of the poor, into meeting the needs of the working class, meeting the needs of peasants and ordinary people. Um, and that really just goes to show you what the difference between different social and economic systems is. Because you know, China and India were in many ways in a very similar position in the late 1940s. Uh, India, as I mentioned, got its independence in 1947. People's Republic of China was established in 1949. But it's in China where the capitalist class hasn't been allowed to dominate political power, where that link between money and power has been broken and that people have been able to make far greater progress. Um, and while I'm talking about that era, I should mention that you know, China's poverty alleviation journey doesn't begin in 2014, which is when the targeted program began. It begins with 1914, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 1949, the capture of power, the Chinese revolution. You know, China at that time was very much one of the poorest countries in the world, had a life expectancy of around 35, had a literacy rate of maybe 10%, uh, you know, it had suffered thousands of years of feudalism, and then the hundred year period from 1840, known as the century of humiliation, which starts with the, the opium wars that we fought um, for, you know, Britain's right to, to dump opium on the Chinese people, um, and that left the vast majority of Chinese people utterly destitute. So the first big anti-poverty programs in China were based on land reform, and they were based on making healthcare and education available to ordinary people in the villages for the first time. And, you know, Chinese economic strategy has gone through different phases. Um, and, you know, we might talk, talk about some of that in the discussion. 
but the proportion of people living in poverty has continuously de declined. Uh, you know, these days the average life expectancy is above 78. It's just overtaken the United States and illiteracy is, is essentially a thing of the past. And if you look at the graph, you can see that uh, it it's not showing the, the years, unfortunately, um, which is just a mistake in my slides, but it's basically, the, it starts in 1850 and you can see it languishing at 35 or so for the first half of this graph. Then all of a sudden from the middle of the 20th century, it starts to rise pre precipitously and it's continued rising very steadily throughout that period, throughout the entire period of the People's Republic of China. Um, so that's a quick introduction on, on poverty alleviation. The second issue I'd like to just very quickly touch on is climate change, because China gets a lot of criticism on account of it being now the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases. Um, and you know, there are a couple of things to say about that. Yes, China is the world's largest emitter, but you know, there are some reasons for that. It's also, it's also the biggest country it's with the largest population. If you measure on a per capita basis, China's emissions are actually pretty ordinary around the same level as Bulgaria or New Zealand. Furthermore, yeah, it's the, the so-called workshop of the world and it has been since the 1980s. Um, you know, the big capitalist powers have exported their emissions, if you will, to the developing world because that's where so much of industry takes place now. It's not simply that Chinese people are wasteful with their, with their resources. Actually, if you look at household energy consumption, it's eight times higher in the US and Canada than it is in China. Um, but all that aside, sort of needless to say, the world very much needs China to reduce its emissions um, and to move towards a zero carbon economy, just as the same thing. Um, thankfully, China is taking that responsibility extremely seriously. And that's something that's um, that it's really stepped up on in the last decade or so. And it and you know, as a result of that, it's emerged as pretty much the undisputed leader in renewable energy. Its total installed capacity is greater than the US, the EU, Japan, and Britain combined. Uh, and its renewable energy rollout is growing much faster than all of those countries still. Uh, for the last two decades, it's been making a really concerted effort to reduce its reliance on coal, which currently makes up around 50% of its power mix, and that's down from over 80% at its peak. Um, China's forest coverage has increased from 12% in 1980 to 23% today. Uh, and if you think of the geographical landmass of China, that's a lot of forest. Um, it leads the world in the production and use of electric cars, trains and buses. Around 98% of the world's electric buses are in China and around 70% of the world's high-speed rail. Um, and there's, you know, you don't have the type of arguments that we have that you see in the US, for example, between, um, you know, green types and, and climate deniers. You don't really see that. You know, there's a very clear consensus at all levels of Chinese government when it comes to tackling climate change biodiversity and pollution. And you know, it's, it's got these targets that it's established of re reaching peak emissions by 2030, before 2030, and then getting to zero carbon by 2060. Um, you know, if it meets those, and I'd say it's kind of almost certain that it will because the Chinese government's not in the habit of making empty promises unlike our own government, then those, those achievements will have, been, will have taken less than half the time they took in the West. So I, you know, I'd say those are really the two slogans that have become pervasive and, and that sort of define the direction of travel for China in the current era. One of them is common prosperity, this idea of not only are we trying to make the cake bigger, but we're trying to share it more equally. And the other is building what they call an ecological civilization. So really focusing on sustainable development, on biodiversity, on reducing pollution, and on preventing climate breakdown. Um, you know, needless to say, there are problems in China, there are contradictions in China, by no means is it a utopia, but I just think it's important to highlight these things because its political, economic, and social reality is just so profoundly different from what's presented in the Western media, particularly in this era of an escalating US-led new Cold War. Thank you.
Lovely. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Carlos. I think um, if it's OK with everyone, we'll go straight on to Keith's contribution so that we can keep our questions and contributions in mind for one discussion at the end there. Does that seem OK to everyone? Yeah. OK, so uh, over to Keith Bennett now. Um, Keith is uh, a member of the Friends of uh, Socialist China and one of the founders of that uh, organisation. And he's had a, a long career in advising uh, businesses, mainly UK businesses, I think, about uh, the situation and opportunities in China. And uh, he's uh, one of, like Carlos, he's one of the, the people in our country friendly to the trade union movement who's got a really deep understanding that we need to draw on uh, in the coming period. So we're grateful for you both for attending, but over to you, Keith. All right. Uh, thanks very much for that kind introduction, Doug. And thanks to Doug and Carl for putting this meeting together. I think it's really important. Now, in terms of China and the world at present, the situation we find ourselves in here is one where the relations between China and much of the Western world, led by the United States and certainly including Britain, are at their worst for at least half a century. That is since President Nixon visited China in February 1972. And it's been quite a dramatic turnaround. In October 2015, President Xi Jinping paid a state visit to the UK, uh, just as his predecessors, Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin, had done previously. And at that time, the British government declared that relations between our two countries had entered what they called a golden era. Not least, it was declared that Chinese investment in just about all sectors of the UK economy was to be welcomed and encouraged. That relationship has all but collapsed and the situation continues to deteriorate. China became an issue in the recent Tory leadership contest, the first time I can remember a question like that impinging on our domestic politics in such a way. And it was a race to the bottom, one in which Rishi Sunak was pressed into taking a number of extreme positions, such as pledging to close the Confucius Institutes that facilitate the teaching of Chinese language and culture in our colleges and schools, as the trust camp sought to portray him as being somehow soft on China for having, as Chancellor, advocated a business-like relationship with the world's second largest economy and our fifth biggest trading partner. Liz Truss, who had already staked out her terrain as an aggressive cold warrior, is now widely reported to be planning to declare China as a major threat to the UK. Yet this almost 180 degree turn in our government's position occurs in a context where there has been no fundamental change in China's system, government, policies or actions. Nor, as I've just mentioned, is this change confined to Britain. There are some caveats. New Zealand has held out to some extent from taking the most extreme anti-China positions. France is sometimes a bit ambiguous, as it also is with regards to Russia. Germany lacks the same degree of bipartisan consensus as prevails in Britain and the United States. But essentially, we see the major Western or capitalist powers centered on the G7 more united in these foreign policy uh, questions than they've been for some time. Fundamentally, of course, the driving force here is the United States, and the replacement of Trump by Biden has facilitated a coherence of the G7's position. Biden is actually much better at not alienating the United States' closest allies uh, in the way that Donald Trump could. Now, this subordination to the United States has a very practical impact, as I'm sure Julian Assange would tell us if he had the opportunities to speak. A recent book on the Five Eyes, that's the long-standing intelligence sharing operation between the United States, Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, by an investigative journalist for the Sunday Times, outlines how it was simply a US order to rip Huawei's technology from our telecoms network, costing the country billions and delaying the rollout of 5G technology. And this narrative has also been largely confirmed by Sir Vince Cable, who was the minister in the coalition government who first negotiated the deal with Huawei. Now, for as long as the Soviet Union existed, US strategy was focused on trying to exacerbate the contradictions between the two major non-capitalist powers, the USSR and China, to the greatest possible extent. With the collapse of the Soviet Union a little over 30 years ago, 
the US enjoyed what's referred to as a unipolar movement moment as the world's sole superpower. At this time, it adopted a policy at the beginning of the 1990s, which said that no power or group of powers should be allowed to develop into a position where they could effectively pose a challenge to US hegemony. Within this context, the United States, for example, in successive Pentagon defense reviews, began to openly identify China as the main long-term and potential challenge to the United States. Yet despite this unpromising backdrop and some periodic outbreaks of tension, on the whole, relations between China and the US remained fairly cordial. In some aspects, they were cooperative, and in some, for example, in the economy, they were thriving. The real downward spiral began not, as perhaps you might expect, with the Trump administration, but with that of Barack Obama, with his Secretary of State Hillary Clinton proclaiming what was called a pivot to Asia. And this essentially had two aspects, attempting to move the US military focus from the Middle East to East Asia and the Pacific, and attempting to corral as much of the Asia Pacific economy as possible into new regional arrangements that would exclude China. Obama actually expressed it quite crudely, saying, we mustn't allow China to set the rules, we must set the rules. The idea that countries might together set the rules freely and on the basis of equality was evidently quite beyond his comprehension. Of course, the decline in US-China relations intensified under Trump, acquiring explicitly racial overtones with the, with the COVID pandemic, which Trump variously described with terms such as the Chinese virus, Kung flu, and so on. Not surprisingly, racist attacks on Asian Americans snowballed. Some people, including myself, I have to admit, hoped for at least some modest improvements under Biden. Biden's and Xi Jinping's terms as vice president had coincided, and they seemed to have enjoyed a decent enough relationship at that time. But whilst dispensing with the overtly racist language, relations between the two countries have continued to deteriorate. And things reached their low point with the visit of US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan on August 2nd. Whilst the US government tried to make out that she did not necessarily represent them on this visit, she is constitutionally the second in line to the US presidency after the vice president, and her visit capped a whole series of provocative statements and actions on the part of the US, with Joe Biden several times stating, factually incorrectly, that the US had committed itself to the military defense of Taiwan, only to have his remarks walked back by aides, leaving a decided and perhaps deliberate air of ambiguity. Moreover, Pelosi flew to Taiwan in a US military aircraft, which was protected by a veritable air and sea armada around her. China in turn took a number of countermeasures, including major military exercises and halting most areas of bilateral cooperation with the United States. Now, why is Taiwan such a crunch point in relations between China and the US? And this has to be viewed against the backdrop of what the Chinese call, and as Carlos just mentioned, the century of humiliation, the period of neo-colonial and imperialist aggression and exploitation, civil wars and tremendous suffering that started with that first opium war waged by Britain in 1840, and essentially ending, apart from a couple of loose ends, with the proclamation of the People's Republic in 1949. In this period, each imperial power basically took a bite out of China. And in this context, Japan seized Taiwan and a couple of small adjacent islands in 1895. In the context of the Second World War, in the build-up to which Japan had launched an all-out invasion of China, the Cairo Declaration of 1943 and the Potsdam Declaration of 1945, among some of the key allies, declared that all Chinese territories seized by Japan including the, Thailand, the island of Taiwan, would revert to Chinese sovereignty. Of course, the post-World War II period saw China once again engulfed in a civil war in which the forces led by the Chinese Communist Party prevailed. The right-wing nationalist forces under Chiang Kai-shek retreated further and further south as the communists advanced until they finally fled to Taiwan. 
doubtless the Chinese People's Liberation Army would also have continued in pursuit. However, when in October 1950, after China entered the Korean War, following US General MacArthur's threat to extend the war to China and even to use nuclear weapons, the US took the opportunity to place its seventh fleet in the Taiwan Straits, thereby freezing the partition of China. For years, the US and many other countries recognized Chiang Kai-shek's dictatorship on the island of Taiwan as the Republic of China, supposedly the legitimate government of the whole of China, as the authorities on Taiwan still formally style themselves. However, especially with the waves of decolonization in Africa and Asia and so on, and the rise of the non-aligned movement, the diplomatic scales began increasingly to tip in favor of the People's Republic. The turning point came in October 1971 with UN General Assembly Resolution 2758 seating the People's Republic as the legitimate representative of the whole of China and the expulsion of Taiwan's representatives. This was followed by that visit of Nixon in February 1972 and then the formal establishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and the People's Republic in 1979. Besides UN Resolution 2758, three Sino-US joint communiques and all the agreements by which China has established diplomatic relations with 181 other countries around the world all stipulate recognition of one China with the People's Republic as its legitimate government. Until recently, at least, it has never been a question of projecting an independent Taiwan, but rather one of who represented China. The idea of an independent Taiwan has only started to be floated now that the, fi now that the fiction that the authorities of ta on Taiwan are supposedly the government of China can no longer be sustained. We hear much nowadays about Chinese exercises in the Taiwan Straits, which after all they regard as their own territorial waters, but less about what provokes those, those uh, exercises. The US Navy regularly sails its warships through the Taiwan Straits under the pretext that they are asserting what they call the right of free passage or freedom of navigation, although China has never sought to interfere with freedom of navigation. In this, they have repeatedly been joined by their allies, including Britain, for example, in September 2021, the first time since 2008, along with Australia, Germany, and others. Other naval maneuvers are carried out by the Quad in which the United States is joined by Australia, Japan, and India, and which South Korea might join following the narrow victory of the conservative candidate in that country's recent presidential election. The NATO summit, which was held in Madrid at the end of June, saw the leaders of Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, and Japan, all countries located a considerable distance away from the North Atlantic, invited to attend the for the first time. That summit also for the first time labeled China as a, system, as a systemic competitor, stating that, and I quote, we face systemic competition from those, including the People's Republic of China, who challenge our interests, security and values and seek to undermine the rules-based international order. Last year, the AUKUS agreement between Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States was unveiled according to which Britain is to supply nuclear-powered submarines to Australia, something that's arguably in breach of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or NPT. And there is also talk of Canada possibly joining this body. Taking all this together, we have a highly and increasingly dangerous situation in which China feels itself encircled and under threats. However, the US and its allies assert that it is China that is, that is being provocative. To try to put this in some kind of context, I'd like to ask, how would people in Britain feel if there was a renegade government on the Isle of Wight, and if Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea were regularly sailing their warships and destroyers through the Solent? With that thought, I look forward to the discussion, and thanks again for inviting me. Thanks very much in, indeed, Keith. I think we should, uh, if you've got that written down, um, it would be great if we could uh, have that, maybe do that as a briefing for our executive and uh, some of our affiliates, if, if that's possible. Ooh, and that's um, 
that would be great. And Carlos has kindly put his uh, slides in the chat, which people can download. And Mark has uh, referred us to some information that he finds very useful on China. So there we are. We've had uh, a comprehensive and succinct uh, summary of um, lots of lots of developments uh, in China and in the world. So I'm sure there's going to be questions and comments that people would like to raise. So, Roger. You're on mute, Roger. That's it. Yeah, I'm off mute now thank you very much for these two very interesting talks um i have had a very long interest in the history of china and wrote uh, considerably about uh, the th this history in a 150,000 word blog that i did over the last 18 months so i've got some background that there's one outside standing question which I'd like to ask the speakers, which I hope goes to the nub of the bigger picture. Um, and that is, why is the antagonism to China developing now? Why is the US asserting its hegemony when it's clear that its economic interests are to co-op Rate with China. Now they've allowed China to develop as far as it has done. Um, wouldn't it be better for everybody to trade together um, in uh, 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 under terms which are world accept were acceptable? Germany has just um, thrown its uh, its arrangements with Russia um, on the bonfire in the Ukraine issue and the Ukraine Russia um, the, 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 the war um, in Ukraine is really uh, a war of the USA against China against Russia um, with <coughs> which is associated with the growing antagonism with the USA so why is this happening now what is it that has changed that allows the the world go towards um, global war um, at this point in history. Lovely. Thanks very much for that big question, Roger. Uh, uh, I'll take a couple more questions. Uh, Robert O'Connell. Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, really good talks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, but just a quick question, really. I suppose, um, what can the trade union movement do to sort of increase awareness and solidarity with China? Because as it stands at the moment, there's very little of either. So um, that I can see anyway. So what, what would you suggest we can do aside from see events like tonight? So cheers. OK, thanks, Robert. Anyone else like to come in at this point? Otherwise, we'll deal with those two questions. So Carlos or Keith, who'd like to come in first? Carlos. Um, I'm happy to have a go. Yeah, please. Um, so uh, in relation to Roger's, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a huge question and, and in many ways it's sort of the geopolitical question of, of, our, of the current era. Um, well, you know, why is the US escalating now? Why is it you know, creating this, this sort of alliance that it calls a democratic alliance, which is essentially a Western imperialist alliance um, against uh, China and you know against Russia and against, uh, if you like, the whole the whole concept, the whole idea of multipolarity. Um, I think that you know there's a few things around the timing, but essentially, if you look at the trajectory of of China's relations with the West, and and Keith gave a, a nice intro to that, you know the West had been pretty happy to incorporate China into a sort of globalized capitalism, you know, into its supply chains, et cetera, so long as China was, you know, as the relationship was based around China providing cheap labor um, to manufacture, you know, the T-shirt I'm currently wearing, um, you know, that, that was essentially fine um, because 
uh, most importantly, from the American point of view, is that it allowed a lot of Americans to get filthy rich. You know, the the U.S. business community and and the British business community and others have done extremely well out of uh, China's uh, kind of reform and opening up process. Um, but you know, that wasn't you know, no one consulted the Chinese about that strategy. Um, you know, that was never the it was never China's plan to stay at the bottom of the global economic hierarchy. Um, meanwhile, we've reached an inflection point. You know, China is about to overtake, is about to overtake the US as the world's largest economy in GDP terms. Um, I think that's due to happen within the next five to 10 years. And in purchasing power parity terms, China's already the world's biggest economy. Um, it's becoming, you know, it's not just a consumer of Western technology anymore. It's a science and technology powerhouse in its own right. It's leading in 5G, it's leading in uh, various components of artificial intelligence and machine learning, nanotechnology, um, and so on, and in renewable energy. And, and, and again, it's, it's playing a very important role in a global struggle against climate breakdown. It shifted from being uh, categorized as a low income country to being categorized as a high to middle income country in a, in a very short space of time, like an unprecedentedly short space of time. Um, you know, China, as, as I said in my intro, China's now overtaken the US in life expectancy. And, you know, in China, life expectancy is still going up, whereas in the US for the last two, three years, it's been going down. Um, and even worse than all of that, you know, China's had this these successes on the basis of its own strategy, its own efforts, and playing by its own rules, not kind of under US tutelage and, and under US sponsorship, as was the case in um, Taiwan, for example, or Singapore or Japan. Um, and as part of that whole process, China's gone from being you know, very isolated to being the largest trading partner of the two thirds of the world's countries. Um, its relations with Russia continuously improving, its relations with Central and Southeast Asia, with the Middle East, with Africa, with Latin America, with the Caribbean, extremely good. And, and it's sort of loudly promoting on the international level this idea of a multipolar system, a system in which the, you know, the sovereignty of all countries is respected, you know, which is fundamentally a more equal, a more democratic way of doing um, international relations than what we've come to expect over the last hundred years or so, or certainly, uh, you know, what the what's sometimes euphemistically referred to as the post-war uh, international rules-based order, which is just a sort of uh, another way of saying U.S. imperialism. So, you know, what I think what's changed is that China has risen, and and obviously, you know, China has been developing in strength uh, throughout this period, and you know, throughout from 1949 onwards. But what I think quantity has turned into quality, and it has become you know it's it's become sufficiently big, sufficiently powerful that it's genuinely considered a threat to the global capitalist and imperialist system, um, and therefore the U.S. has decided if it's going to have any success whatsoever with its project for a new American century, if it's going to have any success whatsoever with consolidating and expanding its own imperialist system, its own hegemony then it has no choice than to wage um, all manner of uh, you know, aggression and hybrid warfare against China. Um, so that's what I'll say initially in relation to Roger's question. I'm sure Keith will have uh, further comments on that, and I'm sure others may as well. Um, in relation to Robert's question about the trade union movement, um, I'm not you know, a, an active trade unionist, and so I don't have a really deep insight into that and, and you know, other people will have better answers. All I would say is, you know, one, one it's I, generally speaking for members of the British working class and for trade unionists, it obviously makes sense to have good people to people and state to state relations with China, you know, on the basis of just simple economic common sense. China's got the, the world's largest market. It's got a middle income population of 500 million people. It definitely wants to have close win-win cooperative relations with Britain. Um, you know, it could be a huge business, uh, a huge boost for British industry, for British manufacturing. So 
you know, and I think it, it seems like a no-brainer for, for trade unionists to take up this uh, struggle that we, we want Britain and China to have good relations. Thanks. Let me just check if there's anyone else who'd like to come in, in uh, just before, in case Keith wants to say anything. Anyone else like to make a contribution at this point? Yeah, Patrick. Uh, we'll keep um, Roger and Robert's questions in mind, but Patrick, you, you come in now, please. It was just it's two questions, really. One is, what do you think uh, the remilitarization, what effect do you think the remilitarization of Japan will have, um, which seems to be going on apace? And the second question was, there appears to be an economic war or technology war being waged against China in the case recently of N NVIDIA being forbidden to sell the artificial intelligence um, to China. Um, and the development of sort of the EU, America and China as separate technology or economic areas. Um, do you see, how, why do you think there has been such a shift away from the idea of globalization to a kind of more uh, an acceptance of you know, three economic blocks in the world or three important economic blocks? world mm. okay great thanks patrick um and D i'll let david in as well and i'm sure that carlos and uh, keith can keep all these points and in, in mind so david carlos touched on something which uh hasn't hasn't been emphasized yet tonight in in, in the two main speeches um thinking of changes on the Chinese side uh, of global relations, uh, Carlos mentioned improved relations with Asia and, and Latin America. Uh, the, the whole question of Chinese relations with uh, what we used to call the third world is surely a, a topic uh, which ought to figure prominently in, in our discussion tonight. Um, I would have thought that one of the factors influencing changes in American and Western policy is the increased uh, interaction between China and the developing countries. Uh, you know, the, the increase in Chinese investment and Chinese loans and so on. Um, is, is this one of the, the big changes that's taking place? Thanks very much, um, David. Uh, now, Robert's just put in the chat that he's got to go because of the kids. So I'll pick up with Robert his question about what we can do in the trade union movement uh, separately. I'll have a chat with him because we're in, we are in, uh, in contact. And uh, just have a look at what Stan has said in the chat room as, as well about the, uh, the US bases around China. And John Pilger's film, The Coming War Against China, is a, is a real thing to watch on that and uh stan's reminding us that the BRICS countries are also doing you know really growing in dominance and um, profile so keith or carlos or let, let's say keith keith do you want to come back on any of the questions or points that have been made so far uh yeah i'd love to um if i can actually you know go back from uh go go through them from the beginning um fairly briefly um if i may but you know so starting with with the point that uh, that Roger made, um, I think that um, one has to. I mean, there, there's so much that that could be said about this. So rest assured, I don't intend to try and say it all. But um, the, I think part of it is that one has to look at you know what what was the Western plan for or expectation of China. I mean, China began what it called the reform and open door policy in 1978 and that's when it entered into world markets and uh, encouraged foreign investment a uh, major boost to foreign trade and, and and so on and that's when like starting really from around southeast asia and the chinese diaspora but then rolling out to japan and, and the western powers you know for, foreign capital and investment was flowing into china and and, and so on now you know did did the you know did the Western powers do this because they were suddenly you know predisposed to want to help develop Chinese socialism? I think the answer to that is is not really. 
Um, so there was, I think there was two, two expectations um, that, that the West had here. One was that China would never succeed in going up the value chain, that it would simply remain, you know, producing plastic flowers, cheap toys, you know, whatever, people being paid a pittance, uh, and 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 so on and and you know we 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 would get uh, we would get plenty of uh, cheap goods. The idea that China would become a world leader in um, R and D innovation, um, you know AI and 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 so on was was never on their agenda. And also they thought that once China dis discovered the delights of the market economy, uh, that it would um, go the way that in fact the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe were were, were going were going to go. That they that through through the introduction of capitalist investment and, and so on, China would change its uh, it, its political color, and uh, and and that the Chinese Communist Party would either disintegrate or fall from power, or it would mutate into some kind of vaguely social democratic party or or, or whatever. Um, now this you know so when I said that the in my contribution that that the China's relations with the West have plummeted, um, but China's policies have not fundamentally changed. That, in a sense, is the problem, because that's not that's not what they were expecting or, or planning to happen. And what they find instead is that, as particularly, I would say, since uh, Xi Jinping um, became the leader of the country about ten years ago, um, as China has developed and become more prosperous, it's actually become more socialist rather rather than less i mean it's a it's a it's a process full of full of contradictions but if you look at the the basic trend so i think that to some extent the western view which in many ways seems to be illogical i mean trying to have a bad relationship with china looks like um shooting yourself in the foot but to some extent i think they have a they, they've taken a view that it's kind of now now or never uh, and that that they either stop, they either try to stop China's rise now, or it will be too late. And and I think that's that's why you get a, a, a kind of almost sometimes hysterical tone to to the to um to 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 the propaganda against China at the moment. What I find genuinely mystifying is the fact that, I mean, we may not like it, but. For several decades, the United States I have to hand it to them. We're actually rather brilliant at um, at keeping Russia and China apart from each other, uh, and and therefore, you know, strengthening their own domination of the world. What what the United States and and the Western powers, including Britain, that follow the United States, seem to be absolutely determined to do is to drive Russia and China closer and closer together. And and that that I think is um, uh, that that I think is really a mystery. Um, in terms of what it's a real shame that um, that Robert had to go because it was such an important question. But I think it concerns um, everyone here. Obviously, I'd echo what what um, what Carlos had said. I, I think that also um, China is. I mean, unfortunately. It's been difficult to travel to and from China um, because, because of COVID, but that won't last forever. I think it would be China is now more open than it was in, in the past to um, links with progressive movements uh, and, and, and so on. I think it would be really good for trade union for trade unions to organize delegations and fact-finding missions to China to actually see. Uh, for first hand when when that becomes possible as I think it will starting from next year um to to discuss with their um you know with with their Chinese counterparts uh I'd, about 10 12 years ago I remember the the TUC had a delegation to China which I think was quite constructive um and and it would be good to it would be good to pick up um those things again uh and of, obviously, we don't know how much more how much investment there'll be from China into the UK now because the whole political climate is against it. Um, but I think when when there is Chinese investment in in into the UK, the the trade unions, you know, need need to have a seat at that table when they're when those things are being discussed. If it's in the steel industry, um, 
you know, or whatever. And I think, you know, the British trade unions that have a long history and, you know, China is at a certain stage of its development. There, there's also things that, that China can, can you know, that, that China can usefully learn from the British trade union movement. Um, on Patrick's things, I mean, the, re, the remilitarization of Japan, which, um, you know, the assassination of Abe is being used to um, uh, promote that, I think, it, it, means, it means amending Article 9 of the J Japanese constitution. Uh, but despite constitutional revision or no constitutional revision, um, you know, Japan, which is supposed to have only a self-defense force, not an army, actually has one of the largest militaries in, in the world. Uh, but obviously this is a, this is just part of that whole package that I tried to describe briefly in terms of this, you know, ganging up of the leading capitalist powers against China. And it's something that's, you know, that's very, um, you know, it, it strikes a, a really sensitive chord in the region. Um, not only with, with China, but but with both Koreas, both North and South Korea are, you know, very wary of this, even if the present government of South Korea is trying to soft pedal it to some extent, but among, amongst public opinion, because, um, you know, Japan has no, never made any real apology for the atrocities it committed uh, in, in the Second World War. So this is this is the, the remilitarization of Japan really increases the danger of, of uh, conflict in, in East Asia, and it's very serious. On the um, economic and technical um, war, again, this is this is a this is a really important question, and I think it relates to to what I was saying a bit earlier. That um, you know, the West had not expected China to advance so far up. The value chain so to play such a pivotal role in the cutting edge of, of, of um, global supply chains so they feel and at Huawei the sanctions that the US brought in on Huawei was the first step but they're now trying I mean Joe Biden signed a new decree uh, just today that just this afternoon um, UK time anyway um, to to try and restrict US investment into anything that's technologically cutting edge in China. So this is this is going to be a a, a real issue. Um I think that um but if one looks um you know China developed you know China put a satellite into space in the late 1960s um uh when it was a very poor country and when um when it had basically no trading relations with either the United States or, or, or the Soviet Union. So I think that the, the issue here is that this, this attempt to starve China of, of the high technology that it still needs in, in some aspects of uh, semiconductors and so on is going to cause some temporary difficulty uh, for the Chinese economy. But what it will ultimately do is actually speed up China's um, China's development of, of these things on, on a self-reliant and independent basis. And uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, always says that you know, one of the strengths of, of socialism, as he sees it, is the ability to mobilize you know, the whole forces of, of the nation in, in, pursuit of, um, in, in pursuit of key strategic projects of, of vital national interest. And that's, that's precisely what's happening in this case. Thanks, Keith. Um, two colleagues would like to uh, ask uh, uh, a question who haven't come in before. So John Fletcher wants to ask something. And Sasha's put a few things in the few genuine questions in the chat room. So if I take John and then uh, Sasha, you come in and just uh, flesh out your questions a bit, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, uh, my name's John Fletcher. I'm a writer. Uh, I've just completed a novel on Wuhan, which is not about what happened there in the last three years. It's what happened there in the 1930s with the Japanese invasion and the incredible turnaround um, in Chinese society, which took place there. Um, I'm, uh, and through that, I've become interested 
very interested in China. Um, I've got two questions. The first is, do your speakers think that now China is more a communist state or a Confucian state? And the second question is, in the shadow of the Samarkand conference and so on with uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, Xi Jinping um, talking alone to each other and so on at great length. How much do you think that um, uh, the Western world is a sort of nation-based state and there's a lot of talk amongst uh, Russians and Chinese and so on, that we are going to turn to civilizational states. India also is an example of this and how this is going to change how the world develops. Do you think it's actually possible, the vision which uh, China is putting forth at the moment, anyhow, that there will be able to be peaceful development and so on, um, and everybody will have a place. Do you think that's actually viable? That's my question. Thanks very much, John. Uh, Sasha. Of, of all my questions, I guess, uh, I mean, feel free to answer some or none of my questions, but um, I guess the first one is, partly being answered by the by the discussion but um yeah when i when i listen to the news i have the impression china is uh something or other with chinese characteristics or or that capital there's only capitalism and then there's a uh, russia or something i don't even know anymore properly the s word socialism so that's the first like very naive but basic question. Um, the next question is probably kind of more easy to understand. Uh, you hear stuff about, oh my God, uh, all these poor people locked in, in, in their buildings, being airdropped food and being told, you know, hanging things out the windows, told to stay in their homes, surveillance, blah, blah, blah. Um, sounds like a nightmare. Um, what kind of truth is there? Are there any parts of China that are a bit like that? And how does it compare to London? Um, and then the last one, um, I had the impression that the news here at, at times was saying, oh, China's threatening, they're not going to, they're not uh, attending to the green summits or uh, they're saying if we don't, if if the West doesn't do this and that, then we'll kind of roll back on our green commitments, like it's a punishment. I'm like, is any of that true? Is that a garbled version of something? So, okay, my three questions. Well, they're big ones. Uh, the the GFT has had quite a lot of Chinese uh, trade union delegations over the years, mm -hmm. and. Um, when I started as general secretary, I used to um, ask them, oh, are you a capitalist country or a socialist country? Mm -hmm. And they, the, the invariable answer was, we're, um, we're a socialist country with Chinese characteristics. So I think that's, that's related to your first mm -hmm. question, isn't it? So uh, Keith or Carlos, if you could uh, respond to John and Sasha, that'd be great. Um. I'll go first, if that's okay. Sure. Carlos will then do a much better job than, than me. Um, so th thanks for all your questions, Sasha. Um, let, me, let me start with, with, the, with the second one and just to make a, make a few, few observations. Um, I think that, um, yes, there are, I mean, China makes a, a lot of use of um, of um, CCTV and, and and so on. I'm not not going to deny that, and I think it's increased a lot since since um, since I was there. I don't think it 
I don't think it compares particularly badly with the amount of CCTV that we have in in this country. It, I mean, there is. A, there, I think that I read somewhere that, like in in, in central London, you you know you're going to you're going to pass a CCTV camera every few seconds. So, um, and and these things, I think they can be they can be used for 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 um you know benign or malign purposes. Um, so I, I think one has to to look at it in um in you know in in a in a in a broader context that uh, you know um you know CCTV can be used to for for you know direct, directing traffic um you know preventing crime ensuring social safety um you know and and so on and and I think one has to um you know one has to just look look at it in a you know, in a, in an all round perspective, and um, and 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 um, and and see what the, you know, what the overall effect is. I mean, I have to say that I'm no more or less aware of being tracked by CCTV in Beijing than than I am in I am than I am in London. But that that's just my personal observation maybe Carlos might say something more about this um the question of um the covid lockdowns well you know, i think that you know, china has china has committed itself to a what you know what they call a dynamic zero covid um policy that is to say they don't want to live with covid they they want to to stamp it out and in, in my personal view I think that China would have, um, you know, if the rest of the world had been able to follow the policies that China followed, then we would have probably eliminated um, COVID by now. Um, the fact is, you know, China has a, you know, a big a big population, and um, the, you know, had had China not carried out the kinds of lockdowns uh, that that it has done, then. The estimates, not my estimates, but from you know estimates from you know U.S. academic studies and things reported in the New York Times, is that something like um, something like six million um, Chinese people will have died, would have died. Uh, as it is, China has one of the lowest um, rates of of of, um, of deaths uh, from COVID of any country in the world. Um, certainly ones that put the United States and Britain to shame. I think Carlos will probably have the, the figures much more at his fingertips uh, uh, that, than I do. And there's, so, so you know, the, I think the, the thing about the lockdowns, the fundamental thing about them is that they've saved actually millions of lives in China. And on the whole, from what I know, they've, they've worked, They've worked relatively well. You've had you have teams of Communist Party members, government officials, volunteers, the Red Cross, and, and so on, checking up on people, making sure they're okay, um, delivering food. Um, are are they are they sometimes not implemented perfectly? Are mistakes made? Are some people bureaucratic and heavy-handed and high-handed? Yeah, absolutely, because. Um, you know, China's a society made up of people, and you know, people make mistakes, and some people are better than others. So, yeah, I'm sure there are, you know, I'm sure there are individual cases where things have, have not been handled well. I mean, there have been and and things that that um, that they've had to learn as they go along. I mean, there were there were clearly some mistakes where they were so concerned about. Um, about the COVID issue, that then people were not, um, you know, people were not admitted into hospital until they had had COVID check, and you know, and and some urgent conditions were were, were not um, were not treated. There were there were some cases like that, uh, but with the worst COVID handling in the UK, we've also ended up with millions of people on NHS waiting lists. So, and I think one of why do I know? Why do I know that um, there have been these in instances where people have not been admitted to hospital where they should have been? I know because 
they've been reported in the Chinese media and on Chinese social media and people in China have made a huge fuss about them because actually people in China speak out much more and much more freely than people people in in, in the West would you know are, are told but yeah absolutely there are, there are mistakes um it's almost inevitable you know it's, it is inevitable in my view uh that there would be um but I think again one of the things that's interesting is that of course like Shanghai which has been the scene of some of the more recent lockdowns is like the most probably the most one certainly one of the, one of the most prosperous um uh cities in China in some ways amongst the the most westernized and it it's sort that those people are more likely to complain because they can't get out and have their lattes or, or or whatever than than people who um you know people who are um in in less developed part, parts of the country it's a sort of it's a sort of western affliction i would say that that you saw in, in parts of china but that that's just me on china not attending green summits i've not you know i've not seen that i mean the recent the recent um, summit that was held, or about a year ago, that was held in Glasgow, the Chinese were, the the Chinese were represented. I think, you know, like like every country, they've had to adjust some of their commit some of their commitments day to day, like about the amount of coal usage, um, according to the economic according to the economic situation, um, and the ups and downs of the economic situation. But I've not seen any evidence that they've used that as a kind of political leverage the one thing that has happened which um which i think you might be thinking of is that after pelosi's visit to taiwan um the chinese said that they would cease bilateral cooperation with the united states on on a range of issues and one of those was china us dialogue on 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 climate change um uh, which i think has has actually there's been a certain amount of discussion about that uh, in China too, and I actually discussed it with um with with people at the Chinese embassy, and I think there's two two things to to be said about that. One, it's the it's the suspension of a dialogue with the United States. It's not a suspension of multilateral dialogues, nor is it a suspension of what China would do. And the point I made um to 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 people in in china is that they that they should stress that actually this dialogue doesn't really go anywhere anyway because it's the united states that doesn't live up to its um its commitments but will try and use the, this dialogue to uh, as a vehicle for attacking china um the how does china describe itself which is also um I think was it um John John part of John's question and sorry I'm not dealing with that enough is yeah I think as as I say they talk about socialism with Chinese characteristics they also talk about um China being in the primary phase of, of socialism or the first stage of socialism um, because obviously China is coming from as Carlos mentioned a a society that where where you know which which carried feudal hangovers you know it was very poor so there was also that you know there, there's been a view and, and again this is unfortunately we don't have time to go into all, all this too much but a view that you had to particularly over the last period that you had to do everything possible to develop the productive forces to build the actual wealth of the country and the question of redistribution uh, took 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 a back seat to a certain extent, and and now that's the kind of thing that that's starting to be addressed. So I think what what's important is that you know if as hopefully we do uh, as I would hope that hopefully one day you know we in this country go, go down the road of socialism, we will do so on the basis of having been the first country to have an industrial revolution, and um, despite the best efforts of some people to destroy it with a with a strong you know with a strong industrial technical scientific base we we um we will be you know in the happy event that we take up the building of socialism 
will be starting a much higher level than the Chinese have had to, to start with. Basically, you know, as Carlos said, 1949 life expectancy was about 35 years old. So, you know, in many ways, you know, conditions in China were literally like they were in England in the 16th or 17th century. And they've had to somehow, they've had to somehow make good that difference in a matter of decades, what, what took us centuries. Um, and, and therefore, you know, therefore it's not a, they're not starting from the basis of developing highly developed socialism, but going at it step by step. I think in the early days, they did think that they could go to highly developed socialism uh, straight away, um, but but that model had some had some problems. Um, okay, um, Keith, thanks sorry. very much for, for those comprehensive responses. Um, sorry, that's another way of saying I talk too much. No, no, it's not. <laughs> um, it, uh, it's uh, thirteen minutes to go, so. Uh, I know Carlos might want to come back on John and Sasha's points, but I just wanted to check before he does so, if, um, not putting anyone on the spot here, but if Ian, Carl, or Mark, or Bryony, if she's still with us, uh, or Stan, who haven't uh, uh, come in so far, if they want to, a question or anything. No, don't, don't necessarily have to. Ian, and then we'll ask Carlos to come in and then we'll uh, wrap it up. I uh, didn't need a lot of encouragement, but thanks, Josh. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you saw the article in The Guardian, uh, there's been a bit of a phenomenon in Japan, of all places, where somebody's published an academic book called Capital in the Anthropocene, which has sold 500,000 copies, which sounds like an awful lot to me. And that's a kind of Marxist analysis of the approach to climate change, which is degrowth. So it, uh, I don't know if you ever mentioned the term degrowth in an economics forum in the UK, but everybody goes deeply quiet and, uh, and are slightly shocked that you've uh, dared to utter such a term. And I'm just wondering what the debate level of the debate might be in China. Is, is there a process in China for tackling um, you know, deep issues like that that are very challenging? And I'm just wondering whether this... The, the climate situation is maybe the reason for the timing of all this increased aggression, because actually nobody knows what to do. OK, thanks very much, Ian. Carl has said that the questions he would have asked have been answered. So uh, I'll go to Carlos and then we, we will finish um, in about 10, 10 minutes, if that's OK with everyone. Uh that's great. Thanks a lot, Doug. And thanks, everyone, for some really interesting, insightful questions and comments. Um, Keith has covered a lot. So hopefully, yeah, so I'll just focus on a couple of things that I feel I could, you know, maybe add something useful on. Just very quickly, um, on degrowth, it's it's not something, it's not an idea that I've studied in in very serious detail and I think in a, there's a sense that in which it's got more application in the so-called first world in the advanced capitalist countries than it does in the developing world uh, for example if you were to go to rural Pakistan and say what you need is degrowth uh, mm -hmm. well, th these are people that don't have you know running water and they don't have access to electricity and they can't run a fridge in their home etc then well you know they need growth they don't need degrowth they, they need to use more energy they need to use more resources um, and I think for people who live in an imperialist country and who've got so much of the historic uh, responsibility for the climate crisis that we're facing um, you know I think you know de degrowth starts at home um, and, and China, of course, is still a developing country, um, and its per capita GDP, you know, it's, it's risen enormously, um, and its overall GDP is, is approaching that of, of the US's. However, its per capita GDP is, I think, around eleven or twelve thousand dollars a year, which is, you know, which is about a quarter of that of the US. Um, so it's it's still a developing country. It still considers itself to be a developing country, and it still identifies with. The developing world with the with the th third world as it as sometimes known um and on that basis it said you know the it's china's line has always been yes we're very concerned with the environment but we're also very concerned with development and we'll defend our right 
to develop and to become a developing country because you know, it's clearly it's obviously unfair for us and for europe and for canada and australia to say well we've messed up the environment and we've got rich off it sorry that's just how it is um but alongside that you do have as i as i mentioned in my presentation uh, china's taking environmental matters extremely seriously um and you like that's filtered through to all all areas of policy making and there's a lot of talk in china around which and i think is a similar concept to green uh, to degrowth in the sense that it takes the focus off gdp and this kind of numerical the single numerical figure by which, that we use as a metric for all economic activity um and talks more in terms of the production of use values the pr production of utility for humanity um and on that basis there's a very senior politician who's been you know kind of at the top and in in or around the politburo for many decades called huan gang who's developed this idea of green gdp which is causing which is creating you know a real buzz in china and is being taken very seriously and xi jinping often talks about um getting used to a new normal which is a, a slower growth rate a slower gdp growth rate but more focused on what he calls quality growth and mm. clearly implied in that is a you know the essentially the two things that i talked about in my presentation common prosperity a, a more fairer division of wealth and you know respect for the planet and 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 consuming limited resources and preventing climate catastrophe so um on that i would say you know G green gdp is um is something to look into um uh, keith keith's talked about you know how china describes its uh system uh, i'll just very quickly weigh in on that a little bit um you know the chinese is very clear that what they have is not a capitalist system it's socialism with chinese characteristics it's what they call a socialist market economy in which yeah it's a thriving market system um but one in which the state retains overall control of the economy via regulation via its control of you know most of the biggest companies which are state owned enterprises and via control of the financial system so it aims to maintain control of what it calls the commanding heights of the economy so you know big industry energy um telecommunications and so forth the four big banks in china are all state owned so you know it's essentially the state is in control of of the the deployment of capital which is a, you know a very important way to exert overall control of an economic system and to apply policy to your economics um and ultimately i you know i kind of think when people say well you know china they've got billionaires and um they've got markets and they've got inequality and all, and all the rest of it what's different from that and and from from a capitalist system well you know the the proof of the pudding is in the eating you know it's china that's been able to do so much uh, in relation to poverty alleviation it's not capitalist countries it's china that's been able to make these incredible strides in renewable energy and the battle against climate change and in reforestation and biodiversity and so on in spite of being you know a relatively poor and developing country it's china that's been able to tackle covid more effectively than any other country um you know covid is another thing that i don't think i have time to get to but you know if if china had followed a similar policy to britain and the united states rather than having a few thousand covid deaths as it's had i think it's about 5 and a half thousand it would have it's estimated that it would be 4 and a half million covid deaths which is you know that's a that's a genuine human tragedy but it's deployed incredible resources to pre to preventing that from happen happening and you know there's no doubt that the zero covid policy has got its uh, drawbacks and its problems but one it's extremely popular because people don't you know chinese people don't want to die from covid you know i i'm i'm sure everybody on this call knows someone that's died from covid or you know knows of someone that's died of covid i certainly do multiple um and you know that nearly all chinese people can't say that um and you know as for lockdowns well i've gone through several weeks of lockdown as have all of you two two lockdowns um 
the majority of people in China haven't gone through a lockdown yet because they do limited city-based lockdowns. Um, but anyway, yeah, as I say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You know, I, my, my contention is that a capitalist country, a country in which, um, in which the capitalist class is the ruling class, um, in which capital dominates political power, can't solve these problems, and a socialist country can. Um, that's what it comes down to. And I think you know, it's reasonable to give the last word in that topic to Fidel Castro, who visited Beijing in 1993. Um, and he made a very nice speech. He said, the path China has had to travel following liberation has been long, difficult and risky in a world where imperialism exercised and still exercises power and hegemonic influence. Colossal successes have been attained in China. The era of disasters and famines has been left behind. Only socialism could have been capable of the miracle of feeding, clothing, providing with jobs, education and healthcare, raising life expectancy to 70 and providing shelter for more than 1 billion human beings in a minute, portions, uh, minute portion of the planet's arable land. Thanks to such a feat at this difficult time for the world's people, uh, you know, bear in mind that's two years, he's writing two years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, over one fifth of humanity remains under the banner of socialism. So. My my general view is that if it's good enough for Fidel, it's good enough for me. <laughs> Great, thanks, Carlos. Thanks ever so much. Um, now, th there's inevitably with such a big phenomenon as, as China, there's lots of things that we haven't uh, had chance to discuss this evening. We haven't looked at the tremendous new development of uh, the Silk Road and all the arrangements they're making. Uh, with so many countries uh, to develop their infrastructure. And we haven't touched on the issue that is always used against China, which is the, the Ouija's and so on. We have just simply haven't had time uh, to go into those. But let me just say that um, we can always keep this, these discussions going. Carlos and Keith and others write very eloquently, either for the Morning Star on these issues or for um, the Friends of Socialist China website, where you'll find detailed accounts of... Uh, of what's really going on in China about about these kind of things. So um, I think we've got to we've got to leave it there. The contract with each other is to finish at at, at eight thirty. Um, thanks ever so much for for being part of this. Uh, we will make it available to others who couldn't make it this evening. Um, this is the first of a new series on called the bigger picture, and uh, I hope you feel like me that uh, it's going to be a very 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 worthwhile series. Um, and this has been a fantastic uh, start to it. So uh, please advertise the fact that the next part of this series is on October the 20th at seven o'clock. Uh, and it's looking with uh, Dr. Francisco uh, Dominguez at uh, the United States and its imperialist uh, uh, aspirations and its economy. So that's going to be good. So thanks a lot. But if Carl, Carlos and Keith could just stay uh, behind for a couple of minutes, that would be great. And thanks, everyone, for joining. And we hope to see you at the next one and, and spread the word.